Good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Um, we made it to the last day of the conference, but this is also a very special day. Today is awards recognition day, and we also uh, we always look forward to uh, to these moments. Since 2005, CIC has recognized excellence in the field of community indicators, projects or leaders on which we want to shine a spotlight because they exemplify what is best in our field. Projects that have techniques or approaches that we consider essential to the success of a project or leaders that exhibit qualities that make them incredibly effective at what they are doing. Every year, the CIC Award Committee takes the, its job very seriously as it comes the field for nominees and pours over references and resources to make the best choice. Award winners since 2005 are listed on the CIC Awards page, and I encourage everyone looking for best practices to use that page as a reference. It's a handy list when we turn when we need to turn to um, quotes or research or techniques uh, when doing research or looking for a speaker. And I recommend that list to others who are looking for examples to emulate. And now we are ready to add a new crop of winners and we will turn the microphone over to um, Alison for the Community Leadership Award. morning. It is my pleasure today to be presenting the Community Leader Award. Uh, the award goes to a leader that has demonstrated extraordinary contribution to the indicators field with cutting edge approaches to translating data into action for the purpose of improving their community conditions and well-being. And I am thrilled today uh, to present this award to Sandra Samuels. Sandra is the president and CEO of the Northside Achievement Zone, or NAS Collaborative, of over 40 partner nonprofits and schools that began in 2003. Along with parents, students, partners, and staff, Sandra is leading a revolutionary culture shift in North Minneapolis here in Minnesota, focused on ending multi-generational poverty through education and family stability. The NAS Collaborative is working toward a single goal, to prepare low-income North Minneapolis children to graduate from high school, college, and career ready. NAS has scaled up in support of over 1,000 parents and 2,300 students as they turn the social service model on its head and lead the creation of a college-bound culture throughout the community. Sandra is a 21-year resident of North Minneapolis and a national leader committed to results-based leadership and accountability. She, her staff, and their partners work tirelessly to ensure the integration of effective cradle-to-career solutions across the NAS Collaborative, to scale and sustain results across the community, and to achieve the systems and policy changes needed for low-income families and children of color to truly share in the prosperity of the Twin Cities region. Since NAS was founded, Sandra and her leadership team have embraced data in their work, not just to keep funders happy, but to identify areas of greatest need, show real impact of their work, inform continuous improvement and strategy prioritization, be accountable and demonstrate the value to the community and their funders. And if this wasn't enough, Sandra has achieved all of this with honesty, integrity, and true leadership within her community through the development of respectful and inclusive relationships with engaged and involved partners many of whom were very pleased to support this award from the CIC. Sandra, your work with NAS is an outstanding example of a nonprofit and community partnership using data for the benefit of the community it serves. Congratulations on this year's Community Leader Award. Thank you so much, Allison. Really appreciate it. Can you, you, can you hear me okay? Allison? Make sure. 
Okay, great. <laughs> so thank you so much. And um, what an absolute honor uh, to get this award. And I know what the team stressed to me was, um, uh, it, it sounds like um, they are cognizant that no one's an island on themselves, onto themselves, and it takes a whole team, but that this is definitely a, um, a leadership award for me. And I am um, humbled by it. I, I do have to acknowledge my team and all of my partners and all of the families that, you know, we've come around each other and really created this ecosystem. But I, I really, really, really want to thank you. Um, it is an honor. And, um, and I want to spend just a little bit of time uh, talking about kind of who I am as a leader and in this work and, and you know, with my partners and what I find um, as the most uh, important thing. Um, Right now, in fact, it's just a perfect time. I've been reflecting a lot on my leadership and the leadership within the community. And, um, and it's because of, in part, um, the times that we're in, right? So um, times like no other, um, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, the, the great pause, you know, we call it, um, that's disproportionately impacting the families that we partner with, but which are largely African American. We have, you know, about a thousand families, 2,200 children, zero to 18. Um, many of them frontline workers already on the edge in terms of um, income and housing and things of that nature. So the, so the pandemic is making us sicker. More of us have lost jobs. In Minnesota, 50% of black people uh, applied for unemployment insurance. Um, whereas only 25% of, of white uh, Minnesotans. Um, more of us are, again, job insecure, don't know if we're going to be able to pay rent. And then, you know, of course, then we had on top of that and the sheltering in place and the distance learning, which is really homeschooling with help from some teachers. And, uh, and then, of course, we had the murder of George Floyd that the entire world got to see, which really took the scab off of ancient wounds uh, in the African-American community and just poured salt in there. Um, we are still reeling um, from that event, which was the tip of the racist iceberg in, in Minnesota and in Minneapolis. It's just the tip, it's not the iceberg in terms of George Floyd's uh, murder. And then after that rioting and looting and, and our stores are closed, we don't have a grocery store right now, we don't have a pharmacy, uh, white supremacists came through and burnt down other businesses. Um, and, and, and it, it has been, and then the violence, oh my gosh, if, if I could even begin to tell you about the unchecked violence and I live in community, I think for me, that gives me a lot of credibility as a leader that I live right in the neighborhood that I'm serving. And we all, we all won't do that. And that's cool too. But I know for me, it's really given me a real, um, sense of, of what the needs are and my role, <laughs> you know, in my role. And again, I think a lot of credibility. So the, the violence has just been unchecked. And I, I say all this, so this is just, it is, um, our world is completely different and everybody's anxious, everybody's fearful, everybody's depressed, it feels like right now. Um, and, and I tell you, so then we have, um, then we have uh, John Lewis's death. And um, and so that's why I, I told you all of that around what's happening in community. But his death um, spoke to me um, and he spoke to us literally with the last message he left us all. I, I, hopefully all of you got a chance to to listen to or read his message. Um, and he wanted it read after he passed. And I know the part that really gripped me. I'm just going to read a, a short part of it. Um, because it lends itself to what I think is an essential leadership skill. Um, he said, uh, together, you can redeem the soul of our nation. That's what it was entitled. And by the way, I, I wondered why he didn't say we can redeem. I'm into we. And my husband had to remind me, like, Sandra, he wrote it because he knew he'd be gone. So it's like, OK, I get it. Um, Though I'm gone. I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. And uh, the highest calling of your heart. You know, I know that each and every one of us who are part of um, this symposium, who do this kind of
collective work. Uh, we do it because it's part of our hearts. And I just thought that was so amazing and beautiful. And uh, um, to stand up for what you believe, always hope. So for me, hope is a leadership skill. It's not a feeling. <laughs> it, well, it is a feeling, a, a thought, and a, right? But it is a leadership skill that no matter what, we don't stop believing in what's possible for ourselves, for our families, for our community, for our state, for our city, for our country, for the world. And that we spend our, our hours and our days um, live, walking out that hopefulness, right? Doing our part. And, um, you know, there's a, a, a song from Hamilton or a verse that says, history has its eyes on you, right? And so we know it does. And history had its eyes on John, right? And, and, and we too. And I know the, the thing that gives me most hope is the power of people together. So I was gonna say, you know, I believe in people. I think we, I, I think anybody doing this work, we do. We believe, we believe in people and the efficacy of every human being and, 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 and the God within them, right? Of each of us. My, my hope and my belief is in the power of people together, right? Together. So we're doing this place-based work. So um, I can't do it without incredible partners in housing, in career and jobs, in health, in early childhood, in K through 12 education, after school, summer programming, colleges. And then my team, of course, that do, you know, parenting education classes. And I, we have family achievement coaches that reach out to, to parents and scholars and work with the schools. This is an ecosystem that has a delicate balance. And we need each other. Like can't, and so for me, one of my things around collaborating, my leading skill there is I say when I'm wrong, like, and I'm wrong a lot. <laughs> and but but I but I but what I do know is that not only am I do I admit when I've made a mistake or I've you know, but I think people also know that I genuinely care about them and who we are together, right? And so I'm always trying to think through. How will this help our families, my staff, our partners, the neighbors in North Minneapolis? Um, there's a there's a one of the founding fathers um, had the you know the whole thing around United We Stand, um, and he, I, I heard a um, a song, and I think it was Liberty for All. The song is, but um, it goes something like, yeah, then hand in hand, um, brave Americans all. By uniting, we stand. By dividing, we fall. And, you know, that's so hokey. <laughs> but it is when, when I consider some of our most intractable um, challenges in our world and our country and our cities today, we cannot do them. We cannot solve them in isolation. And the same thinking yesterday will not work today. And, and it's got to be this 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 unified, collaborative, and unified, by the way, doesn't mean the same. It doesn't. Um, but but a unified collective resolve to transform our communities um, together, you know, and as one by doing that, you know, you've heard of the theory of aligned contribution. That's something that I hold on to passionately. It, it, when we align the contributions we make to a big population level goal, like in ending poverty, ensuring that all children are college and career ready, you know, those kind of things, <laughs> then it is, and then we measure them. And so that's where the whole measurement comes in, right? That you are, and the measurement's not an I gotcha. The measurement is what we're doing is working, you know, or what we're doing isn't working. And so we have to stop what we're doing in real time make some adjustments, do tweak it, do that differently, or do something completely different, um, Lee. You know, our, so we, we are serving families and children and our children don't get a second chance at being children. <laughs> like they don't, they don't get a repeat, right? When we're done with that, you know, 18 years, they're off, right? And uh, the degree to which they go off safely and they, you know, in closing, I'm going to say one thing that, you know, my 
my my hopefulness as a leadership skill, the the belief in um, the village and um, and and the ecosystem, and that we have to do it together. You know, all of that. The for me, and and I'm gonna finish. And this is the data and my leadership, and you know, the highest calling of my heart, kind of thing, is um, escape velocity. And and as I think of the low income African American children in North Minneapolis, um, who who only like 22% can read at grade level, right? Minnesota in Minnesota, 50 we're 50th out of 50 states in graduating Black children on time. Um, I could go on. I could give you so many stats, and I'm not going to do that. But there is, you know, how they say a rocket in order to escape the um, the the Earth's atmosphere and gravity. Right. The ro a rocket has to have like three engines or six engines plus rocket boosters because it and it goes straight up. It doesn't fly like a plane. It goes straight up. Right. Because you're going to you want more power. But it has all this engine power because it's got to break through. Right. And resist the pull of gravity. And so the escape velocity that's needed is strong to overcome the pull back down to earth, right? And then once it breaks through that atmosphere, and of course the atmosphere itself is made out of jelly-like stuff, you know, and, and when it breaks out of there with all of that power, it's like, whoa, you know, and it can release those those rocket boosters because it's up and out. And, uh, and, and for me, what we do collectively gives our children escape velocity to like break through the pull of poverty, to break through the pull of drugs and gang violence and stereotypes that say black and brown kids are not as smart and that our boys were gonna be thugs and and to, to break out of all of that, to low, low expectations or none at all, to, to break out of family dysfunction, community dysfunction, a lack of care and nurturing, to break out of that. Um, the velocity that we give a child in, and by supporting their families, by coming around them as a community is what is necessary for them to break through. So anyway, I, um, you, you, hopefully you can tell I, I'm excited about uh, the work that we do. And, uh, and I just want to, again, thank you for the award. I am completely honored. And, uh, and this, oh, that is so beautiful. I love that. <laughs> um, I am proudly going to share that with my entire ecosystem, with my village of parents and partners and staff and community members. So thank you so much. Sandra, that acceptance speech was so inspiring. Thank you. Um, this is the award that's going in the mail today. Beautiful. And it is, it is, it's a beautiful um, Well-deserved. As someone who lives in your orbit a little bit more locally here in the Twin Cities, I am um, so inspired by what you do every day. I know you work mm -hmm. closely with several of my colleagues and um, really value the commitment you have to community. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on your community thank leader. You. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So up next, we're going to be presenting the Community Impact Award. Um, or Nope, sorry, the Legacy Project Award. Um, so this award, it is, um, it's given to, it's, it's, it's similar to the, community, to the Community Impact Award that we'll hear about in a little bit, um, but it is, um, it's for a, for a legacy project. So a project that has been in existence for, you know, 15 plus years and has been working and engaging community and citizens for, for that long, um, you know, engaging citizens and policymakers and and catalyzing action um, for making measurable and sustainable improvements in in the quality of community life so the community legacy award it recognizes um, projects that have been that have had an ongoing impact in their community um, for at least 10 years and uh, so the the winner of the uh, the community impact or the legacy award this year it goes to uh, sustainable Calgary so this year, Sustainable Calgary celebrated 20 years of citizen-engaged research and action, which is absolutely incredible. Congratulations. 
um, while the indicators are less um, front and center um, sometimes than what you might see in a typical community indicator system, they really are the foundation of what uh, sustainable Calgary of sustainable Calgary's work. And, and then that's very, very apparent. Um, their indicator work informs their citizen participation to address key policy issues in, in the city and advocacy work for local governance. Um, they are calling to improve social equity, protect ecological integrity, create an inclusive and resilient economy, and act decisively on climate change. When they do not, while they don't really disaggregate data in, within their reports, um, they did pioneer representation and leadership positions within Calgary um, as a proxy to understand how Calgary uh, ap applied its commitment to diversity and gender and gender equality. So um, this award, and so Noel Kyog, who is the president and co-founder of Sustainable Calgary, is going to accept this award on behalf of Sustainable Calgary. And I'm very, I'm very happy and proud to be um, uh, to be presenting this word as a, as a fellow prairie, uh, <laughs> prairie dweller from Manitoba. So um, without further ado, um, Noel, if you would like to, to turn on your, your microphone and your camera. To say a few words about, um, about sustainable Calgary. Okay. So am I, uh, I functioning there? Can you see me, hear me? I certainly can see you and hear you. Okay. Um, well, thanks, uh, Jennifer. That's, I'm, we're, we're really proud to have received this award as well and uh, just, just exiting from our 20th year. So thanks to CIC and to uh, everybody, the, the board and everybody who has made CIC what it is for all these years and the opportunity for us to be part of that network. Um, Sonia is a hard act to follow, for sure. Um, but what I, I did prepare a few slides. I just wanted to give people a sense of what we do here in Calgary. So um, I guess the next thing is how do I share my screen to get those uh, to get that PowerPoint up? You'll see that there's a, a screen icon, and you can you click on that. That will allow you to share your screen. Uh, which icon, sorry? Uh, beside the camera icon, there's a screen. You click on the screen and then you click on application and that should be your PowerPoint. Screen. Okay. All right, I'm at select window or screen. Yep, so select the, the applic go into the second, into the middle one, or you can share your entire screen and then put it in presentation mode. All right, I'm not seeing how, entire screen, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, select entire, there you go. Okay. Wonderful, we can see your screen. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll just go use the slides to go quickly through, um, you know, as as was said, this was our 20th year and we had, uh, we were lucky enough to have uh, Julian Agaman come to Calgary last year as part of our 20th anniversary event. Um, and I just wanted to say a few words about this fifth State of Our City report. So, so we did our first report way back in 1998. We got started as, our, as an organization in 95. And we were really inspired by a couple of things. One was Sustainable Seattle, which who was one of the, uh, the early pioneers in all of this sustainability indicator work, and also by the, the Rio Earth Summit. So what we did in Calgary was really as a response to Local Agenda 21 and the call internationally to say, what can you do locally to contribute to a sustainable world? That's kind of our beginnings. Um, in terms of where we're at now, so we've been doing this for 20 years, and I'll talk a little bit about how we've 
kind of maintained our work and and uh, where we've taken the indicators or the, how we've used indicators really as a, a leverage to try to make change in the in our local community. Um, and this 20th, 2020 year report, the fifth report, we're calling an urgent call for a just transition. Um, and what we what we've what we have determined by examining these 40 indicators that we've been tracking for 20 years is that in fact the message to our city is that we enjoy um, a lifestyle that's comparable or above most cities anywhere in the world but it is still less sustainable than it was 22 years ago mainly based on the idea that that inequity um, is uh, in terms of cities in Canada the inequity in our city is larger than most cities in Canada and the level of resources of the earth and the planet that we require to live that the way we do is completely unsustainable. Um, so what we've determined is that we've got a window of opportunity or we've lost the window of opportunity for the gradual transition. And now we have to make a rapid transition. And that's the message that we put out to our council and to our um, citizens and, and other not-for-profit business community in our, in our uh, city. And really, sadly, it's kind of a lost decades, the last 20 years, the work that we've been doing. And, and the, the crux of that, we've uh, what we want to argue or what we, we are arguing locally is that the inability to turn policy into action in our, in our city. And that the problem is not policy, but the problem has been backing up policy intention with budgets and work plans and the allocation of resources. So that's kind of what we've determined through the 40 indicators that we've been tracking in an analysis of those. Another thing that I wanna say is I mentioned that you know, we were inspired by the Rio Earth Summit. So really all of the work that we do is we're trying to put ourselves in the context of members of a global village. So it's not only about how can Calgarians live the best lives they can, but how can we do that in the context of just relationships with the rest of the world? Um, and one of the key things we've been doing the past few years is really focusing on how we get around in a city, one of the core elements of a city. So how do we improve walking, biking and public transit and really move to a position where our city is not dependent on the automobile? And I know this is a dominant issue um, for cities across North America, for sure. Um, also, in terms of, of where we go from here with this last report, the care for the most vulnerable is first and foremost is what uh, what we've the message that we're trying to put forward and and to illustrate with the indicators that we've been tracking um and also we've in the latest report we've added a couple of we've added four indicators in the in the governance domain which we didn't have in the previous four reports and again one of the messages out of that is that we have to get our political house in order our governance or the way that we make decisions has to be fixed in order to achieve all of the positive ends of quality of life and sustainability that we desire. Um, just quickly to give you a sampling of kind of how we're doing in Calgary. So we've been tracking public library use and we see that this is a real plus in our city. We've seen tremendous growth in the use of our public library system over time. Um, community gardens, so food grown locally, we've seen a tremendous growth over the period of the data that we've been tracking in the the number of communities and the number of people that are that are growing food locally we've seen water consumption come way down this is something that the city set its set its focus to and have been successful over time in really dropping down the per capita water consumption which is a real issue in a semi-arid environment in which calgary finds itself um, energy consumption not so good we've actually increased our per capita energy consumption over time and of course everybody knows related to climate change and the burning of fossil fuels that's not a good thing it's something that we still are challenged by being the center of the oil and gas industry in canada in particular and then on the political side this uh we've looked at campaign spending and you can see this is municipal elections and in 2007 45 thousand dollars was the amount spent by the winning the average winning candidate in the council in 2017, that number had ballooned to $184,000. Uh, so that's an issue that we've flagged. Also uh, something that we've created, uh, we've created a bunch of indicators, kind of homegrown indicators, if you will, just gone out and collected the information ourselves and generated information about issues that we thought were important or were, were deemed to be important in our engagement processes. And what this shows you, the, the, the key thing is the black lines versus the the gold gold lines and that shows the difference between the percentage of 
seats that the dominant party wins, which is the black lines, versus the percentage of vote uh, or the, the, that the dominant party uh, wins. Hi, so we have a real disparity there uh, with our first past the post system. I won't go into detail here, but another one of our homegrown indicators is positions of leadership. So what we've done is looked at positions of power and influence in our city. We've collected a sampling of about 250 of those powers of those positions of power and influence across not-for-profit government, media, and corporate sectors. And we've looked at the percentage of women, visible minorities, and Aboriginal people in those in that positions of power and leadership compared to the percentage of those percentages in our general population. Oil and gas reliance index, because we are dependent on the fossil fuel industry, we generated our own indicator, um, an oil and gas reliance index to try to track whether we are diversifying in the city. And then on the health side of things, uh, another uh, indicator that we've tracked is self-reported body mass index. So looking at obesity and overweight and obesity over time in youth. And again, you can see at the at the city, the, the uh, province and the national level, we've got issues there. So those are just some of the things. We've also tried in this latest report to address ourselves to the pandemic and what we've uh, what we've seen or the, the argument we want to make is that most of what we've determined in an examination of our indicators with respect to quality of life and with respect to sustainability holds even more so in terms of the pandemic. And the, the actions that come out of an analysis of our indicators are only reinforced by a consideration of the consider the the condition we find ourselves in in this current pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And likewise, uh, like li likewise, Black Lives Matter has become, um, the movement has found itself in Calgary as well. And again, what we find is that the, the, the analysis that we're making from a quality of life and sustainability point of view only reinforces the importance of Black Lives Matter and equity and, and justice in our community. Um, in terms of how we've kind of organized ourselves over time or where we've gone with this project, we started as Sustainable Calgary started as a project to develop a set of sustainability indicators and we engaged over four years, 2000 citizens to generate those indicators. We have 40 indicators now in seven domains. But what we found in terms of trying to, the longevity of our of, of that project as well as the longevity of Sustainable Calgary itself is that we've found ourselves moving into and using the indicators as, as a springboard or a catalyst into other areas. Ultimately, uh, I guess the message is, how do we go from indicators to action? And, and this simple diagram kind of gives you a sense of, of the, the journey that we've taken more or less. So the indicators is where we started, but right from the start, we saw the indicators as a means to an end. So we wanted to see change on the ground in our community. And we thought the indicators was an important way to begin that journey. Um, of course, engagement and participation was an important part of how we generated that indicators and consider continues to be an important part of everything that we do with Sustainable Calgary, that community engagement in all aspects of our work. So more or less, this is, this is kind of the the model that we've come up with. We have the indicators providing an, you know, an evidence-based arguments, uh, engaging people in every step of the process. And then we've, because uh, a lot of our founders and myself working out of the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape at the University of Calgary, another thing that we've heavily involved ourselves in the last 10 years is the idea of imagining what a future would be like through design. So drawing pictures, simplistically, if you want, drawing pictures of what that future community looks like and using that to inspire people to try to make change. And then using design as a lever for policymaking. So typically design is kind of less left in the design realm, but we've tried to use the design work that we've done to again, leverage policymaking. And again, go to not only citizens, but to policymakers with those images of what a future could be and try to, um, advocate for policy that's on the table as well as generate and create policy and then put that before decision makers to try to make policy change at a citywide level. And then finally, we've recognized that, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, that policy is not enough. We've got lots of good policy now in Calgary, but the sticking point is we don't attach Everyone. budgets to it, Everyone. we don't make work plans uh. based on it, and we don't therefore result in actions on the ground to change things for the better terms of quality of life and sustainability. Um, 
just briefly, uh, these are just some, some screenshots from our website, and I will say this is a pretty quick run through of what we've been doing, but pretty much everything that I've talked about today and what I'm presenting, you, you can find easily on our website at sustainablecalorie.ca, so please do check it out. Um, we have three main projects right now. The State of Our City Report remains kind of the core, the foundation of everything we do. Then Active Neighborhoods, uh, where we focus on active transportation, how we how we get ourselves, wean ourselves off the private automobile and get more walking and bicycling and active ways, more transit in our community. And then housing transportation, food nexus research was recognizing that at a household level, the three highest expenditures across Canadian households, maybe this is the same in the United States as well, is housing first, transportation second, and food third. So we've we've generated a, a bunch of projects where we try to focus on those three things and look at policy, in, integrating those three in terms of what kind of city level policies will make a difference. And this is just some of the projects that we've uh, worked on in relationship to, to those issues. Um, here's just a layout of the, the uh, the five state of our city reports that we've done since 1998 and uh, a, a graphic image of uh, the 2017 state of our city report on the top there. Uh, just some images showing the, the public engagement that we've been doing with active neighborhoods. One of the strategies we've also taken up is we've tried to make alliances across the country. So Active Neighborhoods Canada was a joint project between ourselves, the Montreal Urban Ecology Centre and the Toronto uh, Coalition for Active Transportation that was public, uh, funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Reimagined catwalks, playbooks. So we, uh, right now we're involved in an active transportation project where we're looking at catwalks or engineered walkways. And these are the kind of little cut throughs through our neighborhoods that are just pedestrian or even bike oriented. They're in most neighborhoods in Calgary, but they're really neglected. Uh, so with some of the, the more marginalized communities in Calgary, we started a project about five years ago and it was through the the desire of the people in the neighborhood that we began to focus on these catwalks. So we've, now we've had about a five year timeline where we're really trying to draw attention to how we can upgrade those catwalks and make, make them a core part of an active transportation or a, a pedestrian oriented and bike oriented tra transportation network at a neighborhood level. Healthy places, we've also really tried to leverage the idea of health and draw together equity, public health, urban design and sustainability in a package, in an integrated package. So we've produced a lot of research around the relationship between sustainability and urban design and public health, and use that for advocating for the changes that derive out of our indicators work. And uh, I'll stop right there, I guess, and bring it uh, uh, back, to, uh, back to the screen. So hopefully that gives you a good sense of kind of um, where we've been with the project. Uh, like I say, that's a quick overview. Uh, everything that I showed you was on our website. So if anybody's interested in kind of checking out some of the work that we've done, please uh, check in and say hello on our website and uh, get in touch if anybody wants to follow up some more on what we've been done, if it's of interest. And again, thanks very much to uh, CIC. We've uh, enjoyed being part of this network over the years and really appreciate the recognition of our work and uh, look forward to kind of we're always looking for leverage. So the leverage that the award is going to give us in uh, in in uh, making our, our work more uh, more successful at the local level. Well, thank you, uh, thank, thank you so much. Noel. Okay, thank you very much, Noel, and congratulations again on all of the amazing work that you've been doing over the past twenty years. We look forward to another at least twenty years of 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 action in Calgary, and you know, you never know. Maybe we can do a partnership sometime with uh, Calgary and Winnipeg. That alliance more. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, up next, we have the um, the Community Impact Award, and that's going to be presented by David Abraham. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I have the uh, privilege this morning of intro introducing our next um, awardee, and this is going to be uh, the Community Impact Award. Um, this award demonstrates the power of indicators and evidence, right? Indicators and evidence to drive positive community change. 
Winning projects use data to analyze, communicate uh, community conditions, and engage citizens and policymakers, and catalyze action for making measurable and sustainable improvements in quality of community life. Uh, here, our community is defined as you know either small or large; it doesn't matter. But uh, uh, the impact of the use of indicators must be significant, um, according to our uh, panel, our distinguished panel um, that we had uh, sift through the, the mountains of applications, or at least considerations for this award. It's no easy task, but we have decided on the Austin area sustainability indicators project um, as the winner of this year's uh, community impact award. Um, let me just say a little bit about the uh, about the uh, the indicators uh, uh, project here, and then I'll introduce um, Patrick Bis Bixler, who is here. Excuse me, Dr. Patrick Bis Bixler, who just joined UT Austin, that manages this program, and uh, he's here to accept the award on behalf of of this group. This uh, the Austin Area Sustainability Indicators Project started uh, 20 years ago, back in 1999. They have issued nine reports uh, thus far, um, approximately biannual reports, approximately. Um, and their indicator selection is varied. Um, they have, they're very proud of, of, of uh, saying that they have uh, an indicator on community resilience, um, and they're also tracking climate and equity. Um, the, this indicators project has foundation and government buy-in, and it's based at a university, so it has also academic buy-in, obviously. Um, they undertake uh, their own data collection through uh, a survey of 311 calls. Um, um, they're used by foundations in the area, and they're kind of, they have a, 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 a triage of, of uh, focus areas that they like to promote, and they call it collect, connect, and catalyze. Um, so here again, on, on behalf of the Austin area, Sustainability Indicators Project. Congratulations, by the way. And here is Dr. Patrick Bixler to accept the award. Dr. Bixler. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're extremely honored and humbled to be recognized for this Community Impact Award, which feels everyone, especially meaningful uh, in the current time. We're extremely honored and humbled. Thanks to the consortium for recognition, and thank you to all of you for the important and impactful work you do in your communities. I'm Patrick Bixler. I'm an assistant professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, and I've been running our indicators project for the past five years. Our project, the Austin Area Sustainability Indicators, is in its 20th year of operation. It started in 1999 as the Central Texas Sustainability Indicators Project. The RGK Center for Philanthropy and Community Service at the University of Texas took the project over about five years ago. We renamed and rebranded the project with the mission to measure the quality of life and the sustainability trends that serve as a foundation for a systems approach to address the challenges of our region. We work in service of the six county metropolitan area and focus our efforts across a broad suite of quality of life, sustainability and resilience related indicators. When I think about our impact model, it's immediately obvious to me the somewhat unique position we're in at an R1 research institution in a nationally ranked School of Public Affairs. And what this offers is an amazing opportunity to embed our indicators project into the educational and research fabric of the university. When I think about the inputs to our theory of change, I feel so fortunate to have such an amazing undergraduate and graduate students eager to work on this project and take it in new and interesting directions each year. Certainly in our case, the most valuable asset we have is the intellectual energy we're able to harness from our students and our faculty. We're also very fortunate to have developed reliable and robust partnerships with city and county agencies and local foundations. The financial support of these institutions is critical in keeping our data up to date and making sure we're on top of the trends that are driving the region. But it's not only the financial support, our partners are active participants in the co-production of knowledge as we seek to make Austin a more equitable and sustainable place for present and future residents. With those extremely valuable inputs, we're able to think about collecting, connecting, and catalyzing, which is the way we frame moving from data collection to analysis to community impact. We collect data through a biennial community survey and by aggregating secondary data points from over two dozen sources. 
We're increasingly leveraging university faculty expertise to link passive data sets, such as social media and environmental, mo environmental monitors and sensors to indicators. With the data, we connect to agents of change in philanthropy, nonprofits, policymakers, and other engaged citizens. From connecting, we really wanna catalyze change. One example of this is how our social vulnerability data was used as the foundation for city planning to do an urban heat island monitoring that's happening this week. We have thought a lot about how we move from knowledge to action and the different pathways to do so, the different kinds of tools and products and the different, um, the different user groups who utilize those, those products. I wanna briefly share one example of this that moves from collecting to connecting to catalyzing. A couple of years ago, we had a graduate student uh, who was a graduate research assistant for this project uh, who took the data from our 28 survey, uh, survey data and built a structural equation model. Uh, his structural equation model predicted environmentally responsible behaviors, focusing specifically on mobility choices of, of survey participants, of residents. Um, his 2019 thesis won the best research award that year at the OBJ school. And this paper was recently published in environmental science and policy. In September of 2019, I was asked to pre present this research to the Joint Sustainability Committee for the city of Austin. Is they prepared to update and revise their community climate action plan? One of the key findings of this work and something I emphasized in the presentation was the importance of an equity lens when thinking about the impacts of climate change and climate mitigation interventions. This led to conversations with the Office of Sustainability and the Equity Office at the City of Austin on, on helping them achieve something they've been tasked by the City Council to work on, which was to map locations and populations most impacted by climate change. Myself and a few GRAs uh, on my team had the interest and the resources to work on this, to work with the city on this project. project. To do this, we worked with the Watershed Protection Department, Austin Fire, the Wildfire Division, and, and they shared their data with us. It was definitely a collaborative endeavor to take the data from the city and understand how best to index it to work with our indicator set. This was mapped and the work was presented at the Environmental Commission and is being used to guide the city's community engagement process for community resilience planning. Our report was explicitly mentioned as achieving the task of mapping locations and populations most impacted by climate change as an in-kind contribution to the city in a memo that the city council uh, delivered a few months back. Through this work, the Office of Sustainability introduced us to a grass, grassroots community organizing nonprofit working in Southeast Austin, an under, underserved Spanish speaking neighborhood. And we've been working with them for the last six months to build resilience and help residents anticipate, prepare and respond to climate driven shocks and stressors, as well as displacement from gentrification processes. Through this work, the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation is now a financial and thought partner on our upcoming 2020 wave of data collection, where, where we will place an increased emphasis on, the, on this specific zip code, focusing on the social determinants of health and the drivers of household resilience. This process takes us through a full cycle of collecting data, connecting to stakeholders, catalyzing community action, um, but then feeding that action back into collecting data. So again, on behalf of the RGK Center, the OBJ School, and the University of Texas, and all the great partners that have supported us and worked with us over the last few years, we wanna say thank you. Jennifer, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, are you able to turn your, 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 your camera and your microphone on? Can you hear me? Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, just again. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, you know, just, just to reiterate, we're, we're extremely honored and humbled um, to be recognized for this Community Impact Award, uh, which feels especially meaningful in the current times. Um, you know, thank you for the recognition. Uh, extremely um, I, I so, I'm sort of very moved by being um, recognized with the, the others being recognized right now. Um, and, and I love the, the point that was made a second ago about leverage, 
right? This, uh, this recognition just provides um, fuel to the fire for us to continue doing the work that we're doing in the community, um, grow it, expand it, um, and continue uh, to strive for meaningful impact. So just thanks again. Uh, it, this is truly an honor. Thank you. And we look forward to, to hearing from you again next year on some of the amazing work that you're doing. Sounds good. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Okay, I believe the next order of business is the presentation of the Hall of Heroes Award to Dr. Brian Smale. This is an award that goes to a leader who has dedicated or developed uh, use of tools or methods that translate data into action to make significant long-term impact on the indicators field and the improvement of community conditions and well-being. Dr. Smale has certainly done this. He developed and implemented the CIW Community Wellbeing Survey in communities in several provinces in Canada. Two, Wood Buffalo and Waterloo Region, have now completed second surveys to start building trends over time. He is highly respected both internationally and nationally for his work on national, provincial, regional, and community well-being indicators. In 2018, he was honored by Scotland's first minister who invited him to give the keynote address at an international conference to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Scotland's national performance framework. In 2013, he gave the keynote address at the Wellbeing in Ireland conference. Within Canada, he has played an influential role as a member of the Statistics Canada Advisory Committee on Social Conditions and the Steering Committee of Research Data Canada and three regional governments in Canada are now using the CIW Community Wellbeing Survey to track changes in social and community sustainability or for strategic planning. Most recently, UNICEF Canada has engaged the CIW to develop a child and youth wellbeing survey. It's currently being tested in Brian's local community in the Waterloo region and will someday be available for use by any community across all of Canada. We would like to congratulate Brian and thank him for his years of service and dedication to the field of community indicators. Thank you, Brian, and congratulations. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, this is, is truly an honor and I, I'm extremely humbled uh, to be recognized with this award. Um, I, I think as Sandra, in her very passionate uh, opening remarks on, on her award, you know, talked about the importance of having, you know, a strong team around you. And, and I really do need to uh, acknowledge the people um, on whom I rely very much that in order to get our work done. We're a small team, but we get a lot done. And so I'd really like to give a shout out to uh, Kai Zhang, our survey manager, Jesse. Gao, who uh, is one of our data analysts, and, and Christine Holliday, who we basically stole away from UNICEF. We, she still works with us uh, on the UNICEF project as well as some of the others. And everybody, you know, contributes in, uh, in many ways to the various projects that we do. Um, so a lot of the credit, you know, goes to them for the things that we've been able to accomplish over the years. But most importantly, I want to thank Linda McKessick, our program manager. She's actually been involved with the CIW longer than I have. Um, but she's the everything at the CIW, and, and I really am standing on her shoulders in a lot of ways with respect to, uh, you know, um, having this recognition. Linda's our administrative assistant, our executive uh, person, our finance person, our communications person. She does a lot of our planning and operational work, and she unsuccessfully tries to keep me on track. Um, but nevertheless, you know, a lot of the credit is uh, owed to her, certainly. Um, what I'd like to do is, is uh, just as sort of an overview um, for those that may be somewhat less familiar with our work, um, give you a little bit of our history and why the Community Indicators Consortium Award, the Hall of Heroes Award, is particularly important to us is because of the path that, that we've taken um, over the years. So. Um, if I could then uh, share this with you. This uh, 
a single slide basically um, summarizes our overall framework. Um, the, the overall index uh, that uh, really came about in response to uh, the Beyond GDP movement that's been going on for some years now. The, the project itself actually got started at the Atkinson Charitable Foundation back um, in actually 1999, 2000, when uh, at their board, they said, what would it actually take to measure people's quality of life rather than relying on GDP? So that's really how we got started. So in the years that have followed, and I became involved, I guess, around 2007 and took over as director um, in, in 2011, um, the development of this framework came about as a consequence of, of really grassroots consultation with ca Canadians in terms of what are the essential values that, you know, contribute to having a good life in our country. And it resulted in these eight domains. And within those domains, we identified indicators that we could track over time. And at a recent conference uh, on Beyond GDP, in fact, uh, I got I think quite appropriately, you know, accused of being a naive fantasist by, um, you know, one of the other presenters there for believing that, you know, if we did this work and presented our results to our governments, that they would change. And we realized uh, early on that that was going to be the long road. The other thing that happened around the same time when we developed our index and started reporting at the national level and then the provincial level as well, using you know existing data and indicators approach and tracking progress over time, is that we really didn't have comprehensive data on well-being, quality of life at, at a more localized level, at the community level. And that's really what gave birth to the community well-being survey, which is based on our framework. So we ask a number of questions that are used in national surveys. Um, we've drawn from other research uh, to capture the essence of people's lives uh, in their day-to-day -day lives living within their community, but it's very much reflective of the principles underlying the CIW. Um, we started in the, the city of Guelph here in Ontario, and we've now been in about a dozen communities uh, across the country, and have even done all of uh, Nova Scotia this, just this past year with the survey. And what we've discovered is that grassroots, community-led research with an indicators approach like this using the survey data is really what it leads to change. Communities are far more nimble. They can respond more immediately to the, the needs of their community members that they see as being, uh, as falling behind on areas that are particularly important. And I think what we've come to realize as well is that our well-being framework really allows us to reveal where those inequities occur so that we can address and support those people that are most vulnerable, falling behind due to changes in economic times and so forth. And I think as Noel mentioned, you know, talking about the impact of COVID, uh, being able to identify those factors that contribute most to well-being and therefore are most at risk due to physical distancing, social isolation, and so forth. So it's probably one of the most important times to have community-based well-being research underway so that we can respond to the needs of people in community more quickly uh, and more effectively um, as we move forward. So I think the work that the CIC does, and, and we've been really privileged to be part you know, of the annual conference and, and see the great work that many other communities you know, are doing right now, but that's really where it's happening. And not only is it happening at the community level, but the community level is really what's inspiring upper levels of government and national organizations to take on more of a well-being perspective in their own policy development and ways of moving forward. Because I think it's that work that has now drawn the attention of federal governments, provincial and territorial governments here in Canada to begin consulting with us about a well-being based budgeting approach so that they can invest more effectively in the types of programs and services that can support all Canadians. And I think one of the things that you know, makes this particularly important for us as well is that um, what we're beginning to see now is the kind of change that we originally wanted back when this project got started. And you know, some people have argued that that kind of culture change takes a long, long time to happen. And, and we've seen that, that slow progress. But the flip side of that is if I had have told you, you know, that 10 years ago that the entire globe 
would have now been thinking about well-being as being a more central perspective to take in terms of how we measure progress, moving away from GDP as, as not the only measure that we need to consider, I don't think we would have seen that shift in perspective happen as quickly as it has over the last four or five years. And, you know, in particular, I think, you know, we have examples like New Zealand and Scotland, Iceland, Wales, and so forth, that are already building this in. And Canada is looking at it right now at the federal level as well as part of its 2021 budgeting process. But I often, you know, as many people do, to look to Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, who just this past year said economic growth accompanied by worsening social condition, conditions is not success, it is failure. And I think as long as we adopt a well-being perspective and place it central to policy development, I think we can all achieve that kind of success, particularly at the community level. So as I say, I'm really you know, flattered and honored to, to be the recipient of this award, but you know, it really goes to the CIW and all the people that have been working hard for, for many years now to try to realize that dream of seeing you know, real change within our society towards the good. So thank you very much. Uh, you're muted, Frank. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Small. It was great to have an overview of your work uh, so everyone could see why um, you were the recipient of this award. So I believe we turn over to uh, Chantel now. Yes, hi. Um, but we are, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, we are running out of time, as seems to have been um, a little bit of an issue with all of our sessions. And um, this is just uh, due to the quality, the amazing um, content um, of each of the presentations we've been seeing. And certainly this one was uh, all the way to the top. Uh, you know, you are, as uh, winners, you are really uh, the best uh, days. And uh, we are very proud as an organization to have been able to uh, recognize each and every one of them. Um, we have another session that is starting just right now, um, quality of life indicators. Um, so um, I don't want to be taking away uh, some of the thunder from that uh, uh, um, presentation, but I would like to give uh, a chance for all of you um, in attendance uh, to ask any questions or make any comments or, or uh, connect some of the, of the uh, award winners uh, today. Uh, so we can run this a little bit over if, um, if anybody would like to make a comment. Um, as with every other session, you have, you're certainly welcome to put uh, your comment in uh, the chat box or in the Q&A, or you can raise your hand and we can give you the microphone so you can talk in person to some of our uh, award winners. And just as a reminder, so right, the next section is on the next next session is on the community of life indicators. Then we have a great Pecha Kucha session um, on um, data tools, um, and we will uh, close the conference. And I'm not giving any time since all of your time zones are different, uh, but we will close the conference with a fantastic uh, panel uh, kind of uh, re. Uh, reconnecting on everything that happened over the course of those very long, plus anyway, uh, long five days. So I don't see any questions, any comments? Okay. So seeing none, again, I want to thank every one of you winners, uh, congratulate you, let you know that the award is in the mail. Uh, we wish that we would have been able to hand those uh, personally to you. Um, and uh, we will certainly keep on using your name and your bios and your, um, your examples as um, inspiration. Um, in our work in the future. And I see a whole bunch of uh, thank yous and congratulations pouring in the, the, the chat section. 
So thank you again, and this closes our session.